Welcome to Thriving Entrepreneur with your host, Steve Kidd, third generation minister and 30 year business coach. Listen in as amazing, world changing authors, speakers, and coaches share their struggles and victories. And hear from best selling authors' insight into how you too can live your life as a thriving entrepreneur. This is Steve. Welcome to Thriving Entrepreneur. Thanks for being with me here today as we talk about performance for impact. What are the things that you need to do? What are the things that you can do? How do you show up? How do you perform in such a way? that it makes an impact. It makes an impact in those that you serve. It makes an impact in your own life. And it makes an impact in the lives of those special people that are part of your life. Impact is so important. And when we pay attention to our performance, meaning not how we put on airs, but rather how we get things done, if that makes sense. Um, You know, we can impact the world when we perform at our best level in, as you've heard me say many times, this space of today. What can I do to be my best today? What can I do to perform at my highest level while it's called today? And then unlike the concept of performing, you know, putting on a show, being what you're supposed to be, those kind of things, performing for other people. I'm talking about your performance, your high level of achievement kind of performance. Um, And unlike that, just putting on a show where you're doing what you think, usually more so hope, will make an impact on things that you really can't control rather than being intentional being impactful and doing the things that only you can do and only just having to have to focus on today, then you can create an impactful way of performing today at the highest level you can perform today. There are days when you're sick, you know, I mean, uh, I've unfortunately talked to so many people who have had the winter flu, they've had a resurgence of COVID, um, or they just are tired. Sometimes this time of year, you know, we deal with that a lot. The The sun's not up as much. Um, when the sun is up, it can often be gray outside versus bright and warm and sunny. It's not like you can really, in many places in the world, there are some places But in many places in the world, it's not like you can go outside and feel the sunlight on your face and feel it encouraging you and helping you and making you feel more powerful and more capable. Um, And so we stay in the house and we have to be warmed uh, through, you know, a heating source or things like that. And there's just a lot of things that impact our ability to show up at our maximum level. And sometimes the most important thing that we can do is understand where we are today and then perform at the best level for the greatest impact that we can do today. It's interesting because sometimes the best thing that you could do today is to take a nap, to take the day off and spend it with family, to emphasize and encourage Those things that are really important, the time with the people that are so special and so important in your life is so much better than just showing up at a job or your company or those kind of things and literally performing because it's what you're supposed to do, but rather have a level of performance, of showing up, of being who you are that's the best that you can be today that will allow you to make the maximum impact in this thing that we call today. So we've got three great guests and we're going to talk about performance for impact. How can you not only be the best you that you can be today, but you can do it in such a way that it makes the greatest impact that you can make with the 24 hours that are called today. And that way we can live as a thriving entrepreneur. With that said, Let's jump in to our first guest. Join me in welcoming Raina Salman. Hey, Raina, how are you doing today? 
I'm doing great, Steve. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Start us off first by telling us a little bit about you and how you show up in the world. Yeah. So my name is Raina Solomon. I lead Solomon Consulting and where we partner with sales organization to elevate their sales team's performance and sales effectiveness. I'm in Austin, Texas. I've been very blessed to work with organizations from all around the world, uh, from hyper growth to large uh, organizations and uh, just published my new book and excited, Steve, to uh, to talk to your audience and to share some of my insights. Well, since you mentioned your book, tell us a little bit about your book and what's the title of it and what's it about? Yeah, my book's title is Sales Essentials, and it's really looking at the foundational essentials way of selling uh, to your uh, to, to your uh, buyers and adding that value. And it really looks into what we need to do before, during, and after the sale. And Steve, I created in a way that anyone that um, that gets that book, it's written in a way where it's very easy to consume and digest. And it's almost like a reference guide where the reps can use it anywhere and anytime throughout the sales process, as well as, of course, entrepreneurs that are trying to sell their solutions and their products. I love that. We're in a little different time uh, now than we would have been, say, two, three, four years ago um, in sales. Are you finding that uh, people are promising they're going to buy stuff and then not coming through more? Um, what are some of the kind of nuances that you're noticing in sales great. cycles right now? Absolutely. Great, great question. I think the biggest competitor for us, Steve, is indecision. Um, uh, we go through the whole sales process and some of your listeners may be facing that as well. And the reason there's indecisions is because there's a lot of uncertainty in, in the world, our economic uncertainties, political uncertainties. And so our buyers are, uh, are sticking to the status quo, right? And so our job as sellers and as entrepreneurs to kind of paint the picture and show them the impact of not changing, the impact of not taking, you know, going to the next steps and investing. And also it's upon us as salespeople to be flexible and creative and to work with our with our customers to create a solution that they're also comfortable with. Because in the past, we used to sell these, you know, really, really large deals and, um, and, and the economy was awesome and great. But in today's world, we got to be as sellers, very flexible, actively listening and also challenging our customers' thoughts. Um, our customers know, our buyers know what they know. But when you come in with your insights because you're working with other customers and you can see what's happening, uh, that is also a way to to uh, to influence their behavior to do what is right for them. There's so many uh, phases to the sales cycle, um, you know, all the way from the leads all the way through to actually having the person write the check. Um, although I don't know anybody writes checks anymore these days. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, one of the things that I've noticed recently is once we move a person past indecision to the point where they say yes, that there seems to be a lot of people that are experiencing um, procrastination in the paying cycle or what we used to call back in the old days, remorsing on deals that they've agreed to. Ooh, remorse. Buyer's remorse is a big deal. And that's why it's really important during the sales process to sell the value, right? To, to really understand the buyer's pain point. What are their, their pain point? What are their challenges? And then speak their language and show them how you can help them address some of these challenges, as well as, as be very transparent of what it can and cannot do. Overpromising is is not a great approach to building high trust relationship. So being transparent, really understanding the root cause, going back to why we're doing this and why we're having these conversation and aligning it to business outcome and collaborating with the customer. And also, Steve, I would also recommend to your buyer, to your uh, to your listeners, to make sure that you're qualifying the opportunity properly. Because if you're talking to your, the, the wrong buyer persona and you're trying to force sell something and, and try to, to uh, make yourself believe that, hey, this is a good fit for us, 
uh, that's going to be that the pain later on after you close that deal, because now you're spending a lot more time trying to convince yourself and the buyer this was the right approach versus upfront from the beginning, having these qualification criteria and qualifying in quickly, but also qualifying out quickly because there's an opportunity cost. Anytime you are landing the wrong deal or you're spending spinning cycle trying to convince someone to buy from you who you know they're not the right fit, uh, you're losing an opportunity to be talking to the right people and closing the right deals, which is really important in expansion strategies because the, the, when you sell, the goal is not to just land. The goal is to expand within these existing accounts. And if we don't have the right buyers, um, that the, the the chances of expansions expansion is 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 reduced. One of the things, even as you were talking, that I was thinking about is the fact that, you know, all too often we assume what the person wants versus actually doing this crazy thing and asking them. Yes, 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 yes. Um, and also, Steve, I would say. And not just asking, but also doing our homework, right? In my book, I talk about the importance of preparation. And, you know, when, when you and I probably started selling, the internet was either not there or was just started. So getting that information was harder for us. Now you have information about people and their business, and we got to be prepared going in, taking an outside in perspective and leading with the buyer, and validating our research, and then asking relevant questions. One of the things with, with a lack of preparation is that you may ask a question that your buyers are saying, well, you should have known that if you took two seconds and looked at my LinkedIn profile. And that's why preparation is so important. And when you go into these meetings and you want to ask this, a question, uh, bring in that research and say, look, I looked at your LinkedIn profile and I noticed that you just increased your uh, headcount by X percent in the last two years. And then you ask question, tell me a little bit about blah, 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 right? So you set it up and now instantly you're gaining that credibility and you're aligning to their business needs and to their business. Mm, I love that. Oh, that's good stuff. Um, you're referring back to how long ago we both started selling. Um, <laughs> uh, one of the things that I've found, and I'd love to hear your take on is, there's always these people that are out there that are trying to come up with some kind of new way. But what I'm finding more and more is, is that what the truth is, is that sales hasn't really changed that much over the course of my life. I mean, there's some different uh, mediums, you know, like the internet that we use, but the basic concept of selling really is the same as it was from the people I was listening to back, you know, I was listening to them in the eighties and they had recorded it back in the sixties. You know, if you think about B2B sales, right, what what what, what I do, um, it's always been about the human. When we take the human element out of sales, uh, we really, we fail. Uh, because if, if we look at who's making these decisions to buy from us, they're people. They're people, not, not these faceless entities or a brand. You're dealing with a human being that has emotions, that has fears, that has uh, as career aspirations. So taking to make taking these into consideration, that has not changed. Influencing behavior, which is the root of sales, has not changed. What has changed is that, like you said, the channels, the information that we have, some of the tools that we use can make us more efficient. But the fundamentals of actually building high trust relationship in complex deals, in these in these enterprise deals, is 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 fundamentally still about the human connection. It's still about building that high trust. It's still about being competent and having the character and the intent and the motives to help the person. Um, and, and and now the, the the what we see happening though is that are we have more decision makers in our sales process. We have more. We have different buyer personas coming in. So we're seeing more of the CFOs are part of our buying process because of the tight economic climate that we're in. Every dollar matters that organizations are spending. So the deals are getting more complex in terms of conversations that we're having and in terms of the type of people that we are having conversations with. But the fundamentals of, of, of the sales process, of doing your homework, of showing up and having a business level conversation, of adding value of sharing insights, of actively listening, of embracing silence, of collaborating and participating, of designing a customized solution and treating people like a person, not a number, 
that is still fundamental and we we need to make sure that we are not not bringing in all these jargons and and and, and making it even more complex than influencing a behavior so let's talk just a little bit about closing um cuz what i found most of the time is the age old concept and i'm going to go back to really an old quote here is people still have a really hard time asking closing questions and even more so being quiet after they do. Um, are, are you, can you give us some tips on how to be able to elegantly close and, you know, just actually ask a person to buy something from you? Yeah, I think it's a great question, right? Salespeople, we have problems with, with not talking. In fact, what we see is that um, top performers are talking less and listening, listening more, but the average performer talk more than listen. And so that's one area of self-awareness and that comes with practice. And that comes with really you have, you, you, you practice how to pause and to how to embrace the power of an effective pause. Because what happens when you're talking and rambling um, and you don't pause to hear your, your customers uh, answer you, or the minute your customer stops talking, you jump in because you're afraid of that space of no talking. Um, you miss out on exactly what they're going to tell you. So that's one thing I would tell you is embrace the power of a pause. And I had to learn it growing up in sales, and I had to really listen to my calls and practice the power of pausing. The second thing about closing if you have done your job right in the discovery phase, if you have built this high trust relationship throughout the sales process, if you have shared insight and positioned yourself as a credible source and the buyer has seen the value that you provided them, you shouldn't be waiting till the last stage of the process to ask for closing. These conversations need to be happening throughout the sales process. You have to understand what is their internal decision-making process? What is their, what, what, what is their um, kind of pains that they're trying to solve? Uh, what is their initiatives that they're trying to drive? Do they have a compelling event? Because when you have a compelling event, that means there is a timeline that they need to solve that problem. And all of that, Steve, happens throughout these discovery conversation, right? And understanding, hey, you know, when, you know, when, what is the internal um, approval process? Who needs to approve this? What's the timeline? These conversations should not be happening, you know, a week before the quarter ends, trying to, to really force someone to, to sign that, that, uh, that SOW and issue that purchase order. Mm, I love that. Um, so many things that you have to teach people. Um, how can a person work with you? What kind of uh, stuff do you offer? Yeah, great question. And thank you for asking. So I work with, with hyper growth organizations as well as, as large um, at large organizations to help it, to help their reps improve their sales performance. And if you're looking at the sales process, that includes anything from the pre-call planning to the closing and to also expansion of opportunities. And there are certain programs that we also offer, Steve, such as um, how do we communicate with purpose? How do we uh, how do we uh, use social selling to build our pipeline? How do we prospect? How do we cold call? How do we use a cold email? How do we use referrals? Um, how do we uh, conduct a, a discovery conversation? How do we sell value? So all these programs are created to help us in navigating that sales process effectively. Also, in addition to that, if any of your colleagues that are listening are looking for kind of online quick uh, quick tips about sales tips, they can find me on Teachable and I have Raina Sales Academy. And these are, I, I created these, Steve, because um, while I don't work one-on-one -on -one with consumers, I wanted to make sure that anyone in the world that wants to learn how to sell can get access to some of the information that I've that I've been you know creating and working through in the last close to twenty years. So they can find that and they can purchase it and they can do these uh, these courses and they can do these quizzes and they can get those one pagers. Also, last but not least, the book itself. Look, I've been working uh, on this book for more than a year, and it includes. I did not hold back. I gave the readers, everything that I've seen as someone that does sales consulting um, and have worked with top performers all around the world, and also things that I've experienced as a seller, the wins and also the losses and the lessons learned and the stories and the toolkit. And so I would highly recommend your, your, your listeners pick up that book 
um, look at it from your perspective of your business, of your deals, and start customizing and applying it to your to your world. It was published by McGraw-Hill, which is one of the top publishers in the world. Very grateful for them taking that book to the next level. And the book, again, is called Sales Essentials, the tools you need at every stage to close more deals and crush your quota. Oh, wow. So much more. We could have probably three or four hours worth of conversation. Raina, we'll have to have you back on. Thanks so much for spending some time with us here on the show today. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for having me. What will help your team perform at the highest level? What will you do to help their performance and the impact that comes from that? How can you empower your team with the sales essentials, with the things that they need so that they show up with a powerful performance in doing the things that they need to do to get done today, this week, this month. Uh, As we head towards a whole brand new year, what are those empowering, powerful, elevated things that your team can really perform well at and succeed and really thrive in all that they do? Because ultimately, that's what you want for your team. You want them all to live and thrive. Here's our next commercial. Hi, my name is Steve Kidd. I am a third-generation minister, an international best-selling author of multiple books, and I help people write, publish, and market their books to bestseller. In fact, there are literally thousands of people that have used the system that I created to be able to write, publish, and market their books, and now they're best-selling authors, and you're next. I just wanted to come on for a minute, say hi to you, tell you a little bit about me, introduce myself, and tell you I know the world is waiting on your message, and I would be so honored to be part of sharing your message with the world. Go to AskStevekid.com and schedule a time to talk today. This is Steve. Welcome back. Thanks for listening to Thriving Entrepreneur today as we talk about performance for impact. What are the things that you can perform at the highest level of your ability maximizing just today? So not necessarily what was your ability last year, last week, last month, but rather just what can you do today? How can you be the best you that you can be today with a mind, an eye, and a goal towards impacting, making the greatest impact that you can make out of the things that you do. We talked last segment about sales essentials and team performance. Now let's take a deeper look at some of the more personal things that you can do with your team as well as with yourself to help you be a thriving entrepreneur. Join me in welcoming Arizona. Hey, Arizona, how are you doing today? I'm doing very good. How are you there, sir? I am doing really good, thanks. To kick us off, tell us a little bit about you and how you show up in the world. Well, um, my name is Anthony Rosano. I am a certified public accountant and an NFL contract advisor. Uh, I've been an entrepreneur uh, from the time I was a very young man. At the uh, age of probably 21, I started my first business. But um, you know what? What makes me interesting, I guess, is uh, is on October thirty first, nineteen eighty seven. I was involved in a tragic fire on the day of my Pop Warner Championship football game, uh, where I was burned over eighty seven percent of my body, third degree burns, uh, and never expected to make it. I was taken by Life Flight uh, Hospital after I was engulfed in flames and put up by my neighbors uh, to the West Penn Burn Unit in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, given 0% chance to survive, uh, the, the doctor said, if I live for a day, I would die in three days. If I live for three days, I would die in three weeks. And um, as they had predicted three weeks into it, uh, my blood pressure was 49 over 20. My heart rate was 189 beats a minute for three consecutive days. My temperature was 106. And the doctor said there, there was nothing more they could do. They quit uh, administering medication and began uh, the process of telling my family to make funeral arrangements. 
Uh, for, fortunately, by the grace of God, I, I made it through that night through many prayers and uh, some really mar miraculous events, um, and then would uh, move on. And uh, and a couple of weeks later, I was back on my feet standing. Um, and then uh, a couple of months later, I was on the I was uh, I was released from the hospital. Uh, had a miraculous uh, uh, physical therapy stint for three years, uh, 43 surgeries, 134 blood transfusions, and uh, ended up uh, making my journey all the way back into athletics where I excelled both as a golfer and uh, ultimately made it back onto the football field where I was a starting outside linebacker uh, for the Newcastle Red Hurricanes as a senior. Um, you know, now I've taken uh, this this injury, this accident, and what I've uh, and what I've accomplished since then, and uh, and I did some research on it and started to to really figure out what were the key elements that helped me to succeed and to to come out of this, and I was able then to identify some principles and uh, and incorporate them those principles into building a business, into a business advisory program, and then being an entrepreneur. And uh, and so I'm very excited to talk to you about some of these things. And uh, and I just wrote a book named Against All Odds, uh, a story of uh, uh, faith, courage and never giving up, uh, which is on sale on September the 26th uh, all over the world, really. And and uh, it's it's a it's a very exciting time. That's amazing. Um, I think it's both interesting, a little scary and very cool that, uh, you know, that you came back from having been that far gone and even went back to playing football. I, I'm sure your parents must have been cringing. Well, you know, that's a, that's a very interesting thought and, and I'm sure that they were as well. Uh, but the but the thing about it is, you know, when it, when it was when I was in the hospital, the the whole idea, what 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 my calling card was was the was the notion that I was going to make it back onto the football field uh, from the moments, uh, the first moments into the emergency room uh, when my mother and father said, Hey, we're, we're going to get out of here together. Uh, I was asking if I could play football uh, the whole time I was in the hospital, every time that they would take my breathing tube out, uh, I would ask about playing football. When I was discharged from the hospital, it was all about getting back on the football field. So, you know, and that's something that I learned is actually, a uh, a tenant in business, you know, a tenant in business is that you have to have uh, you know, like a never give up attitude and not only a never give up attitude, but you also have to have no fear. And so, you know, one of the things about starting a business or overcoming any problem is that is that you have to adopt certain philosophy. And and along the way, I recognized uh, I learned something about Murphy's Law is that if you have fear, okay, in your mind or in, in your heart, it is more likely than not that you're, that those feel, fears are going to realize themselves in your reality. Um, what I was blessed with is even though I was injured so bad, I didn't possess much fear. Uh, I had, I had a ton of faith, a ton of people around me who were supporting me and, uh, and they gave me the belief that I could get back on the football field. And, uh, and in fact, I did. And so, yeah, there was, a, I'm sure my parents maybe had it in the back of their mind, you know, what's going to happen. But they also knew that if I endured 87% body burns, there wasn't too much that the people on that field could do to hurt me. That is absolutely for sure. That is totally a cool story of uh, both resilience as well as the comeback. I love the concept when the doctors say, oh, you're not going to make it. And then you make it anyway. And it's, it's, I love stories like that. So tell us a little bit. I mean, people need to get your book in order to be able to uh, to get all the things. But tell us maybe one of your favorite things that you quote out of your book um, that can help people in their life and business. Well, that's that's a great that's a great, 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 great question. And, you know, when you when you Leighton inside of my book is, is a story, as you're saying, of resilience, of of coming back. Here's, here's what the facts of life are. The facts of life are that at every stage of our development, that we are going to be faced with adversity. I don't care if you are just a two-year-old learning how to walk right, 
or if you're a 85 year old suffering uh, uh, and, and needing to, to, to care for themselves without the help of many others around them. You're always gonna be faced with adversity. And as a business owner, uh, every step of the way, you're gonna be faced with adversity and need to have uh, resilience in the, way that you, in, in the way that you carry on your business. Um, so most people quit when the going get tough. OK, most people uh, don't believe uh, that that they can make it. And so, first of all, they're going to get this idea and this notion of resilience. And then they're going to see me get knocked down uh, by fire and knocked down by the tremendous pain of 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 uh, dressing changes and and being given no hope by the medical staff. And then they're gonna see comebacks and in, in, uh, of, of being of giving glimmers of hope and, and getting back on my feet again, only to get knocked down again. It's, it's a true story of, uh, of waves and, and uh, uh, in a roller coaster ride. And, and that is true also in business. Uh, in business, you, we all often go through a roller coaster ride. But the truth of the matter is that just as I had uh, explained uh, Murphy's Law, there's other laws that are in there, like uh, relying and surrounding yourself with the best possible team of people that can help you through. Um, I was very fortunate to get the, the doctors, uh, the best doctors in the world who were able to chart out a medical plan that was that was beyond anything that anybody could have ever hoped for, and they tried uh, experimental procedures on me that that just that in fact worked. Well, in business, sometimes you need to make sure that you have the proper legal uh, team, the proper financial advisory team, the proper, in some cases, board uh, of directors, and the proper mentors that can help you to also uh, navigate the road. And see, and see, there's a direct parallel to what happened to me in that hospital in the way that you need to uh, go after things in your business. You need to be surrounded by the right team. Now, the medical staff, they also had to put together a treatment of care plan that, that they were they had to put it down into writing what, what it was they were going to do to, to try to preserve and save my life. Well, the same thing is true about an entrepreneur and a businessman. The entrepreneur needs to write a business plan out with people who are smarter than he is. So because if you're going to beat any problem, if you're going to overcome any adversity, you're about 50% there by the time that you write it down. And then you follow that plan. Um, so so there's many different parallels that I talk about in this book that that really uh, give business owners uh, the the idea of of what of of how to create success in their life. Um, you know, the biggest problems uh, that a person faces in a business is, is is they don't have clear instruction about which way to go how to do things, okay? And it's, that's why it's so important to, to have the right people around you and, and to prioritize information and intelligence over emotions and things that naysayers say on the outside. And, and to focus on what you can manage, like the, the KPIs in your business and the business metrics and the, and, the, and the financial analysis and have people around you to give you that advice. And the, and the same things, these are what were was done inherently uh, at the time that I was in the hospital. There was a complete analysis given, and uh, and and they managed it the right way. So there's so many different entrepreneurial lessons uh, that are learned here, and I and I think that when you read my book and you read my story, you're going to experience a wave of emotions, but also inspiration to know that if I could get through that, then you could get through anything, and we can accomplish great things in business together. Mm, I love that. So, uh, you know, you work as, you know, with the NFL, some of the highest achieving people in the world. You've been through some stuff yourself. Um, from your experience, what would you say is the number one thing that kind of holds people back, that keeps them from really being the best that they could be? Well, it's internal self-talk, okay? And it's fear, okay? Uh, people in the world are generally achieving greatness or excellence is is uh is, is something that is it's very hard to do but here's the problem most people feel that if they're not perfect that they can't be excellent okay and so but the truth of the matter is none of us are perfect 
So there are many people, especially high achievers, who are perfectionists. Well, here's the news. Every single successful person makes mistakes every single day. And the fact of the matter is who the person that I consider the most successful entrepreneur on the planet today is Elon Musk. And I admire him and I watch him very closely. But the fact is that every day that they're trying to create an autonomous vehicle, there's a snag in the way, there's a failure that happens, and you don't ever hear about those failures. But they keep trudging along in engineering and, and re reprogramming and re going and going after what they need to go after. And ultimately they meet their goal. So I believe that the what holds people back the most is this this. Uh, inherent fear uh, within themselves or this desire to be perfect, which they say, you know, because I'm not perfect, I can't. Well, that's just not true. You have to be perfect only in your ability to get to, uh, get up every time you're knocked down. Oh, I love that. A buddy of mine taught me a phrase years ago that I, I stole from him and I use all the time now. Um, he said, you know, practice makes perfect is actually a total lie. Because if you practice doing the thing the wrong way over and over and over again, you're not going to get any better at it. You're just going to be really good at doing it wrong. <laughs> exactly. Oh, I love that. So what's your hopes for the book? Um, what are you hoping people will get out of it and uh, you can do next for them? Well, uh, there's there's lots that can be garnered out of my book. It's uh, it's really a, a, a story like you've never really heard. Um, you know, to be, I had my last rights given to me three times. Um, I had to learn to look at myself uh, in a different way. I mean, when I went into the hospital, I was this young athlete who was really strong. And then I come out with burns all over my body and my head shaved. And even my skin tone was different on my face, which fortunately wasn't burned. So I had to learn to love myself in a different way all over again. I had to learn to adapt because now I had one hand and I had to learn how to adapt to real life and, and how to play sports and, and how to play golf and, and football and, and do all the things and be adaptable and, and, and not see it as uh, a limiting factor, just figure out how to make it happen on my own. Um, I had to surround myself with mentors, uh, people who love me uh, and were, were willing to encourage me. And then I also had to learn. Uh, I lost some friends uh, in high school, uh, and and I had to deal with the fact that, you know, here's this person sitting in this casket who who I really loved, and that could have been me and was supposed to have been me just a few years ago, and and to to go through that wave of emotions and and to read this story, this narrative is something that I find I think was you're going to find completely inspiring. Uh, totally motivational. I think it's going to, I think you're going to probably cry when you read it. You're going to laugh when you read it and you're going to come on, out of there thinking, you know, I I can, I can accomplish more than I ever hoped. I, I thought I could, because if this kid and that family could go through what they did and now he's married with children for 24 years, the owner of a CPA practice is well-educated and overcame all this adversity. If he could get there, then I could certainly uh, build a business and or, or even uh, stop an addiction or uh, or find a new uh, uh, this, a special person in my life. I I can accomplish. Uh, I don't have to live in a place of darkness. There's going to be brighter days ahead. That's amazing. So uh, people can get the book on Amazon. It's called Against All Odds: A Story of Faith, Courage, and Preservation. Uh, pres <laughs> Perseverance, I can talk, um, <laughs> by Anthony Rosano. Um, Anthony, is there a way that somebody that would want to work with you can uh, get in contact with you? By all means, look, uh, take a look at my website. It's uh, www.anthonyrosano.com. That's A-N-T-H-O-N-Y. R-A-Z-Z-A-N-O.com. And when you go on my website, you're going to find a lot about my story. You're going to see uh, the business advisory practice that we have. And, and, and you can actually go and submit your information right there. And, um, and, and I'll give you a call. Or you could send me an email at anthony at rosanoconsulting.com. 
And uh, and that's again Anthony at R A Z Z A N O Consulting dot com, and uh, and I'd be more than happy to talk to you. And uh, you know, so I, I do feel that I'm an expert problem solver, and I'm able to provide insight for people in in ways that I, I don't think too many people can. Uh, whether it's solving a tax problem or deciding what type of business structure that you want to have or deciding between two different paths or or uh, helping you to prepare your financial statements or or even to arrange financing. I, there's there's a lot of things that I can help you with. And um, and I'd be more than happy to chat with you about them. I love that. Well, Anthony, uh, great book, Against All Odds, A Story of Faith, Courage, and Perseverance. See, I said it right that time. Um, <laughs> you can get it on Amazon right now. It's available in pre-sale. It'll come out on September the 26th. So if you're listening to this after September the 26th, it's already available. Anthony, thank you so much for spending some time with us here on the show today. Well, you are really fantastic, Steve. Thank you so much. And please uh, keep doing your hard work. You're, uh, you're, you're making a difference in this world. And that's something very special. What are the metrics? What are the statistics? What are the financial ends of things that are the stuff that people are going to look at when they're evaluating you? And how can you get the help and the advice to be able to perform at the level that the people that you really want in your world and you really want to work with they want to work with you too. What a great way to make an impact and to be a thriving entrepreneur than to perform at the level that is your best while it's called today. Hi, my name is Steve Kidd. I am a third generation minister, an international best selling author of multiple books, and I help people write publish and market their books to bestseller. In fact, there are literally thousands of people that have used the system that I created to be able to write, publish and market their books. And now they're bestselling authors and you're next. I just wanted to come on for a minute, say hi to you, tell you a little bit about me, introduce myself and tell you, I know the world is waiting on your message and I would be so honored to be part of sharing your message with the world. Go to AskStevekid.com and schedule a time to talk today. This is Steve. Welcome back. Thanks for listening to Thriving Entrepreneur today. We're talking about performance for impact. What are the things that you can do today to perform at the best level you can today to make the greatest impact in this world? How can you be the best you just right now, right here today? Whether that be molding the performance of your team or finding the right situation for yourself or is it the things that are the most important to you that will help you make the greatest impact in your life today? Let's take a look at that and think about how we can thrive in all that we do. Join me in welcoming Carl Becker. Hey, Carl, how are you doing today? I'm doing super. Thanks for asking. So to begin us off with, tell us a little bit about you and how you show up in the world. Yeah, I love that. Um, you know, I'm somebody that, well, I, I consider myself an entrepreneur and a sales coach and a consultant. I'm really somebody that plays for change. I think what fills me up the most is when I'm able to connect with somebody or a group of people. And when we have a conversation, there's something that they want. There's something they want to change or improve in their lives. And we start to talk and we learn about what that is. And together, we start to kind of create a path forward of what that could look like. And they leave inspired and like really understood. So for me, I would say, you know, I'm what I play for, if you think about it that way, is I I play for impact. I really I enjoy helping people move forward with the things that are important to them, whether it's family or friends or at work. And what does the uh what does the term impact mean to you? How does that show up both in your own world as in as well as in the world of the people that you work with? Yeah. I mean, I think impact is such a it's such a good word because it to me, it means you're moving something forward. You're bringing something that's important to you forward into the world. And hopefully, whether it's a small, just like something really small where, you know, did I impact my kid today? Did I impact my friends today? Or 
you know, did I impact my relationship with my parents today? Did I do something where I feel closer and more connected and people are understood? And, the, and, and when I think people are understood, more possibilities happen in the world of sales. That means I'm probably understanding my customer better. Um, in the world of leadership, my team and I are learning each other, you know, learning each other, learning about each other better, and we're able to, to make more things happen. So to me, impact is almost like movement. Like, how can I impact somebody? How can I help them understand where they are, where they want to go, and then help them on their way, help support them on that journey forward to the things that are important to them? I love how you said that because you started with the concept of knowing where you are, you know, and it's so hard to get to anywhere if you don't know where you're even at to begin with. So uh, let's start there. How do we even know where we are? Yeah. You know, I was with a, another consultant friend last night and we were just talking and it was kind of a casual and formal, I guess you'd call it a brainstorm session. It was really just two friends that happened to do similar things talking. And I said, look, you know, if I could help you find your next best client, what would that look like? And he's like, well, it could be this and it could be that. And maybe I, it's, I'm a fractional role. And, you know, it kind of went around and I let him just kind of process out loud. Some people process out loud, right? And so he was processing out loud for about five minutes. Then I said, okay, well, let me ask you a different question. There, those are all the things that you could do, right? These are things you could do. You have the ability to do, but what do you want to do? And it kind of got him thinking about, wow, I have the choice to maybe get the clients or the next project that I really want. And so that shifted the conversation to um, helping him understand not just what he could do, but what he really wanted and what would fill him up. So I think for me, helping people understand, even if it's for myself, what do I want? Where do I want to go? It, it does start with some introspection. And, it, and I think it, it, at least in that conversation and other conversations I had, it's trying to separate what I can do and what I really want to do. Because those oftentimes are very different things. And if we start doing what we can do, we might find ourselves in a place, whether it's in a day or a year or five years, and all of a sudden, how did I get here? You know, Why am I doing this job that I'm not that excited about? It's because we did what we could do, not maybe what we wanted to do. Mm, what we could do, right. not what we wanted to do. So uh, let's take that maybe to its crazy conclusion, and maybe you'll have a really great answer for us here. I hope what? So. Uh, yeah, I do too. Um, often when we get to that, what do I want to do? It tends to be a little bit on the impractical side and almost always all of us kind of run into the, well, this is what I'd really like to do, but I don't have any idea how I'd make money doing that. Mm -hmm. So what do we do at that point then? You know, part of, part of my answer is also the, the, the new book that I have iceberg selling. And the whole idea with iceberg selling is you only see 10% above the surface of most situations. And I really believe everyone's an iceberg. Like we're only seeing the 10%. And when we get curious, we, we start to explore and we try to understand whether it's ourselves or the people we're interacting with, what's below the surface, what's really there, then I do believe more possibilities show up. And when we have more possibilities, we can get into a place of what I call co-creation. We can start to figure out, now that I've seen the whole picture, you will, or the whole iceberg, if you will, how can I move forward with that? And so I think my answer to you is, um, you know, if, if we're starting to play around with what we want and all of a sudden, maybe our pragmatic brain says, you know, I, I could never really do that. Then, you know, I, I think my first invitation would be, how do you get more curious with yourself? How do you live in possibility? And even just say, you know, all these preconceived notions, whatever my baggage might be from how I was grew up or past jobs, I'm going to put that over here on a shelf. I'm just going to live in possibility. What could it look like? And I think by living in that place, even if it's just for five or 10 minutes, you might get an answer you didn't see before. And what we're looking for are answers where the possibility feels like something that you actually could do. Now I understand, you know, if I say, hey, I, you know, I'm 51 years old, I want to be an Olympic athlete. That probably isn't going to happen. Um, it's not really completely possible. Maybe there's something else in that where I could support Olympic athletes or I could volunteer because maybe what I really want to do is be around that stadium and see all these different people from all the world coming together. Maybe that's what I want. So I think it's a lot of a yes and not a no, but, you know, um, but for me, it's really, you, you gotta, you gotta play around with possibility and see if you can find that direction that you want. And because most likely there might be a different flavor of the thing you really want. If you feel like the thing you really want, is just, isn't possible. Ooh, I like that different flavor of it. 
think a lot of times we get stuck in the, it has to be this way. So how do we trigger or trick, I'm not sure which is the right word, our brain into taking that kind of idealistic concept and begin to look at it in other ways that could be actually viable for business or money or life. Yeah, we're, we're starting to talk about some of the secrets of life here. And, and I, I, I don't claim to have all the answers to the secrets, but I'll tell you what, what I typically do. Um, first, I think it starts with self-awareness. Like if I feel that my brain, my body, my whole being is tight and I, I and even physically, I feel tight. Um, it probably means I'm not opening myself up to possibilities. I am, I'm, I'm in a place of fear or preconception that I, that I get to know what reality is going to happen, that I get to know possibility. And, you know, sometimes for me, I can feel it and I have to be like, oh, wait. And I'm also one of those types of people that might be walking around the house talking to myself like, okay, Carl, like you got to just, you know, whatever that's bugging you right now, let's put it over here for a minute. Let's go for a walk. Let's talk to a friend. I'm going to walk with my wife. We're going to kind of talk and I'm just going to talk it out again. I'm a type of person that needs to talk it out. But I think the first thing for me is realizing I'm at a place like that that self-awareness. And if I'm, a, uh, you know, if I have a coach or I'm working with somebody else and I, I know I can't create enough self-awareness to move me out, then I think the buddy system, having somebody that really understands you, like the story I told of this other consultant, we were just sitting around and I think possibly happened because we started to talk about it. So I guess to kind of answer the question is, um, do the things that work for you. You know, you might be a learner where you need to hit a whiteboard or you're somebody that talks things out, or you need to read things. But I think it starts with that self-awareness and then trying to understand how you're wired and how to at least, even if you just give yourself the gift of, you know what, for the next hour, I'm not going to think about this. I'm going to go on a ride. I'm going to walk with a friend. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to cook because I like to cook and I'm just going to see what happens and shows up for me. Um, in my advice or in my world, you got to give yourself enough space to see what else can show up. And sometimes that's really hard because the noise in our brains are so large, but I don't really know any other way um, other than just trying to intentionally put yourself in a place that's safe for yourself to explore things, whether it's independently or with others. So tell us a little bit more about your book. Yeah, sure. Uh, the book is called Iceberg Selling. And like I mentioned, you know, the whole concept is if you're in sales, I don't think our job is to convince people or manipulate people. And I'm even going to say to just drive toward a revenue goal. I think a lot of those things are baggage that we start to carry with us if we're in the world of sales or we're just business people because we're, we're selling all the time. Like we're sharing our ideas and trying to bring past forward all the time with whoever we're communicating with. And I really believe that there's kind of this problem that we have culturally or in our brains where sales has to be this thing where you're salesy or you're pushy or whatever it might be, whatever shows up for you. And I'm here to tell you, it doesn't need to be that. Sales is actually about really seeking to understand, spending the time, being of service to working with someone else, understanding what is showing up for them. What are their challenges? What are their problems? And the more you're able to do that, the more as a salesperson, and I'm going to almost say a guide, you're able to start to understand if you can really help this person. Can you be of service to them and help them move something forward, achieve the thing that this person wants, solve the problem that they have? And I think first we have to change our mindset in this book. This is what this explores. How do we change our mindset about this? And then how do we get to kind of this vision that everything's an iceberg and that if I can learn more and more about what's really going on with this customer that I'm talking to, um, then I can see more of their reality and I can start to co-create a path forward with them. I can get into conversation about what could be possible, what solutions could look like, and then move it forward to kind of support them in making sure that happens. And the book really explores how awesome it is to be in sales. Um, it explores what are you playing for? It explores some mindsets that I think if you just picked up one or two of them, you're going to feel more comfortable and more successful in what you do. And then it explores five best practices of, of really how to what I'm going to say, iceberg sell, understand what's underneath the surface and move solutions forward. I love that analogy with the iceberg. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, what, what's after that? You know, what, what can people do with you after they've read the book? Yeah. Um, well, I, I guess I would say, you know, if we were talking professionally, I, uh, I speak at conferences, I run workshops, 
Uh, I have a consultant practice with other consultants like me where we come in and focus on building happy and high-performing sales teams. And yes, I said happy. Um, I'm a firm believer that culture um, and team are really important and that they can they can really move a business forward. So for me, you know, if it's professional, those are the things, you know, visit the website, improvingsalesperformance.com. If after you've read the book, there's always resources there. Uh, I'm blogging all the time, sharing thoughts all the time. And then I would just say personally, you know, if you're curious, reach out with a question. I, I'm, I'm the type of entrepreneur that, you know, I always like to be of service to others and share the things that I've learned. And so I, I think the invitation would be uh, follow me, read what I have. I have some other books. Or, and if you're just curious, send me, send me a fill out the form, send me an email, ask me something. I'm happy to respond. And if I can support you, I'm going to. I really appreciate that. So give us again the uh, URL for. Yeah. How to reach me. Yeah. Uh, it's improving salesperformance.com. And if that's too long and just type in iceberg selling, that's the name of the book. And I have a site around the book as well. And you can find me through either of those channels. And the book again, iceberg selling you got Carl it. Becker, Carl with a K um, Carl, before I let you go, give us uh, some words of encouragement. Yeah. I would say if you're somebody who's in sales and you feel like you can be bigger than you are, that you can have more impact, that you want to change your life. Maybe you want to buy a house, you want to get married, you want to support your kids, you want to support your parents. If there's something that you're playing for and you feel like you're stuck, I would tell you, um, kind of explore you know, what you might be carrying uh, from your past, from your upbringing, uh, things that might be your stories that you're telling yourself of what it means to be in sales. And if that kind of gets you intrigued, uh, read the book. And <laughs> it kind of explores a couple of stories where some individuals are are kind of letting go of some of the baggage that they have because it is in you. Um, sales is an, an amazing career. We, you know, we put the presents under the Christmas tree. We help people make payroll. We we pay for college. We allow companies to grow. We add the fuel to the engine. That's the economy and these businesses. So if you're in sales, you're super important and you can be whatever you want to be. You can take ownership and and move it forward. And if there's some things that are kind of breaks or slowing you down that I might call head trash, like, let it go, move on. Um, you're really valuable to the company and to your families and to yourself when you can provide solutions to people. And I would say, go for it. You're a really important, a really important part of the economy and of the world and making things happen. I love that so much. Well, Carl, thank you so much for spending some time with us here on the show today. Yeah, I had a blast. I appreciate all the questions. Thank you very much. How do you make the greatest impact in the things they're the most important to you. How do you move forward today towards the life that you want? Not just today, but in the future. The best way to impact tomorrow is to be the best you that you can be today. To embrace and realize that you are uniquely brilliant. You were created for a purpose and the world needs you. What are the things, what are the ways that you can have the maximum performance for the greatest impact just today. Not worrying about what you did or didn't do before, not worrying about what you need to do tomorrow, but how can you just be the best you that you can be today and have a poor performance for impact that makes a difference in the world today so that you can live as a thriving entrepreneur. I look forward to seeing you again next time. Thanks for listening to Thriving Entrepreneur today. If you want to get your question answered, send an email to questions at wehelpyouthrive.com. We look forward to you joining us again next time. Hi, my name is Steve Kidd. I am a third generation minister, an international best-selling author of multiple books, and I help people write, publish, and market their books to bestseller. In fact, there are literally thousands of people that have used the system that I created to be able to write, publish, and market their books, and now they're best-selling authors, and you're next. I just wanted to come on for a minute, say hi to you, tell you a little bit about me, introduce myself, and tell you... I know the world is waiting on your message, and I would be so honored to be part of sharing your message 
with the world. Go to AskSteveKid.com and schedule a time to talk today.